Tonight is the second Raymond Abram Memorial Lecture. Raymond's final State of His Architecture address was delivered at SciArc on March 3rd, 2010. Raymond's will, his perseverance, and his conviction is what we celebrate again this evening. And we continue to treasure Raymond's architecture and his teaching by extending the driving spirit of those efforts in this annual lecture series. An architect's reach must exceed his grasp, or what's a building for? There are architects we have come to know who insist on minimizing the scope of contemporary architecture. They'll tell you architecture has no, no political sway, no urban consequence, no sociological content, no programmatic meaning, and by the way, the contractor won't bother to read your drawings. And what's left to us, these minimalists say, is architecture either as an entirely pragmatic endeavor or architecture as, as entirely a private muse and a private musing. Let's call this hypothesis architecture as almost nothing. Tom Main, on the other hand, has the broadest ambition for contemporary architecture. Architecture's reach as expansive and growing. For Tom, that minimalist musing is not at all amusing. On the contrary for Maine, architecture's a rough house and a rough house on every urban street corner. At its best, architecture reimagines the city reinvents its language, modifies its sociology, alters its meaning and our meanings as a consequence. For Tom, architecture is forever a social, a political, and a cultural provocateur. Let's call this hypothesis architecture as almost everything. Tom recently met a learned New York architect, an advocate of the architecture of almost nothing. How do you build almost everything, the New Yorker asked. And Tom answered simply, you build the wind. You build the wind. But how do you represent what you can't see, asked the New York savant. The wind is a force, complex and devious, said Tom, a mystery. You can't see it, that's true, but you can feel it and see its consequences. So almost everything architecture is an allegory, asked the New York architect. No, said Tom, imagine the wind whipping the clouds stirring the dust, downing the trees, ripping at rooftops. The strongest wind bends the city, reshapes its life and its lives. Architecture gives form to the wind. The New York architect stood up and left the room. We will build a sky horse, said Tom to himself. Please welcome the sky rider Tom Main to the second annual Raymond Abram Memorial Lecture. This is uh, without 
doubt the uh, place I prefer to speak. Starting, of course, with the, uh, the introduction I'm going to get from uh, Eric Moss. The, um, and I have to say, I, the, the, I try to get here as much as I can. I, I was here, of course, last Monday and Tuesday night, and it'll be impossible not to refer, make certain references uh, to what was taking place those two nights. Although I have to say, um, I think that's exactly why um, there's dialogue, that there's disagreement. And the fact that it, it caused a, a certain amount of conversation, I think, is actually a very positive thing. The, um, and I'm always aware, uh, as I look at the audience, it's such an unusual place in terms of um, such an incredible support system. There was a conversation last week about East and West, and I found it kind of curious and kind of backwards, I have to say, and that um, I cannot separate my own personal development um, for 40 years um, from this city and the, many of the people that are in front of me right now that um, produced a, um, such an immensely collegial and such an incredibly intelligent set of conversations that are um, so important to the city and, to, of course, to this institution. I'm going to, um, in, a, in an hour, plus minus, um, as a, um, a practitioner that has uh, taught for most of my life, um, try to impart um, some questions that I'm dealing with in terms of um, the architecture of our discipline and um, some idea of a trajectory and the notion of uh, attempting to um, find a, um, a position at this moment of time, let's say beginning in the 21st century, which I feel is um, relevant to um, the academy and to our profession. And I'm going to um, track uh, my own trajectory, which has had a certain um, inevitability, let's say, that's led me to certain questions and certain um, conclusions, provisional conclusions. person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. They've got the flag up now. This is the end. Beautiful friend. Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. This is the end. I'd like to evaluate the uh, various paces that a person can... If you were um, born when I was born, and uh, were a young man in the 60s, um, I can tell you it would be absolutely impossible to see architecture um, outside of a political realm, whether it's Martin Luther King, whether it's Vietnam, or whether it's the aerospace. You're looking at um, the first 15 or 20 years of my life, one minute will equal plus or minus six years, and um, a certain set of values, a framework that I was looking for and it started with autonomy and resistance, and it had to do with authenticity, although I have a very different idea what that word means. It had to do with various notions of contamination, with the idiosyncratic, with the use of found material. It had to do with um, the notion of oppositions, which that first set of images conveys. It was impossible not to understand the um, architecture as having something to do with the, um, the resolution, the looking for some organizational coherent Con context having to do with the radicalness of the contradictions of day-to-day -day life. Um, it was beginning to talk about relationships, um, conversations, um, connections, and that from the very beginning I was um, questioning the notion of uh, the objectness, the, the, um, the, 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 separate, the separate nature of an, of an architecture versus its, um, its potential for making radical connections. And it was um, instinctively interested in uh, differentiation, both as a response to the modernist project and a notion of, uh, of the kind of radical similarity that was proposed by that project. Well, that's an oversimplification, uh, the, the early part of that project. And, um, and then very early on, and I have to say, um, tipping my hat to Raymond, that um, I'm uh, again, uh, a, a debt to Raymond and interested in landscape. And it started with a notion of digging 
and um, the connection with the ground and architecture's um, symbolic role in terms of its relationship to, um, to the land and, and more currently one that's moving towards uh, the biological. Um, as is maybe evident by these series of images, there was a, um, an instinct in the importance of, um, of locating your voice, of locating your um, presence, and um, establishing a, um, a framework. And, and mm, I think very much maybe part of LA and many of my colleagues here in my generation, a, um, an understanding that one has to control the conditions of one's own artistic methods and processes, um, which was somewhat difficult within the, um, the corporate or the, um, the, the, the part of our practice, which is, which is part of a, um, the enterprise, a, a capital enterprise. And that um, I would say is one of the connections of a whole generation of architects, which still to this day is part of this institution. The, um, I've broken a series of projects that's going to lead to a series of questions into a, uh, a middle or an early middle phase and then a, a later phase. And this is going to start in, um, in the middle 90s. And it was um, the beginning of our first work and our first larger scale work. And I remember when um, I was visiting the site with Richard Weinstein, uh, this is the Diamond Ranch School, and he looked at me and said, um, Tom, um, it, it's finally happened that you've connected the aesthetic project with the, um, the social project. And it was a, um, for me, um, really maybe a, a beginning of, um, of a practice in a more, um, in a broader sense, which allowed me to um, make more explicit the ideas that were implicit in the smaller work. And it was definitely um, a radical shift. I have to say that one of the things that takes place with um, project versus practice, by the way, I have no belief in that whatsoever. The two are absolutely integrally connected. But the notion of your, your interest as, as um, your conceptual interests, your desires that 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 they're the, the, the focus of the work, um, they're absolutely affected by the uh, trajectory of your office over X amount of years. And uh, what took place in this early phase was there was a shift in scale in the work. There was a absolute shift in client structure. It was moving to um, collective and public. There was a um, an increase in programmatic complexity and a desire for performance. And again, things that were implicit in the earlier work were now becoming more explicit in, in this scale of work. And it was the, um, the beginning of a, uh, an extension of the integration of building and landscape, which this building very much pursued. And am I? Yeah, OK. And um, there was, of course, of just the beginning of um, the computer environment. And so the, um, there was the beginning of a shift of the early, um, hmm, the, the, the first um, translation of ideas into some sort of a singularity was taking place. And there was also now a shift in the complexity of the office having to do with the, um, the broadening of a project team, which included all the engineering, in this case, over engineering. And that was a, a beginning of a, 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 or a continuation of an integration of the thinking that goes into a project as it moves from an idea to a reality. The, um, with the Hypo project, um, I, I was very lucky. I'm, what am I? I'm 48 or 49 years old as we were developing this project. We won a competition. I remember. It, Somewhere before this, I was extremely frustrated and angry, and uh, that like we, we couldn't find any kind of work, especially in this country, of any kind of scale. And I remember uh, FO, FOG telling me that no, you'll you'll be you'll go out of the country. It's not going to happen here. It just isn't possible within this culture. And he was correct. And um, we arrived in, in Austria to this project, and it was a um, allowed us a very very different set of opportunities of connecting. Uh, 
um, a higher level of aspiration and understanding that we could realize it and um, allowed us to think in a very, very different way um, the, the, um, the way we could approach this project having to do with the realities of this environment. And um, we were now able to explore at a larger scale, say something like Sixth Street or any number of projects that were interested in a, um, a radical diversity, a building that represented a, um, not a singular notion of an organization, but multiple ideas of organization, which had to do with a building that represented um, multiple viewpoints, which in some ways were mimetic of a, of a visit to a town or a village. And with this came additional advanced um, uh, performance requirements. This one having to do with a very complex work environment, the promotion of uh, the workplace, transparency, et cetera, that all kind of drove this thing. And when we got to Toronto, um, again, these were all done within mm, three, four year period. And um, again, we're working in another culture. We're working for an academic institution. We're working in a highly urbanized site. And um, we won this competition. And it was, it was very much about the establishment of a, a perimeter of the university. It was about an idea of, uh, of architecture moving out of the boundaries of private and public. The piece coming over the street was a threshold. It's a gateway. It came directly from the competition. And it's allowing us to expand our capability is an office both in tectonic terms, and in terms of methodologies of developing buildings, and we're starting to grow and develop as a um, uh, the institutional nature of a practice. Okay, um, then there's a series of projects that follow. There's maybe a couple of years in between, and now there's a, a somewhat of a consistency, and the issues are going to change. Um, are they going to be? Um, they're going to. They're going to evolve. There's an evolutionary process taking place, and there's going to be three things that clearly are changing in this process, and they're. Um, it's not positive or negative. They just are. They just exist. Um, one has to do with a, a continued shift in methodology, and it's moving towards uh, the digital environment, and it's having to do with both the ability to. Uh, absorb larger amounts of information and translate that within formal terms and it's going to absolutely affect the work and um, there is going to be a shift to the strategic and the tactical um, I think up and through this period I saw myself as a designer and architect in a much more limited way in a, in a formal sense and again it started from the first slide you saw fuck you um, it was an absolute insistence on resistance and a notion of an architect as a, a singular character um, confronting uh, a somewhat hostile environment. Um, hmm, this was changing a bit. It had to with this kind of work. Um, and, and it had to do with negotiation. And this, I think, is one of the most complex, complex territories in, in our profession. And that um, as one works on larger and larger scale work, um, one has to have the ability to form a um, a, a constituency of an agreement with a project. And it's always a, um, there's no answer to this. It's always going to be confronting some singular vision. And I mean singular, I always talk about it in a, in a, in a collective sense. Uh, singular in a sense of this, my studio, which is a collective enterprise. So um, we, we arrive in, um, and again, we win a competition for Caltrans. And um, hmm, any number of things are now taking place. Uh, we. There's all kinds of issues that we're still pursuing, having to do with the specificity of the site, the specificity of working in the city, the particular notion of um, of Caltrans as a um, as infrastructural, as a um, um, itself as a maintainer and inventor of the uh, the network that that defines Los Angeles, the freeway, and it's um it's interested in in, in itself um, fragments of incompleteness. It's itself infrastructural. It's graphic, are the generators of the idea. And um, it's radically specific. And where's John? We were discussing with Enright after his lecture about the specifics. And John, I'm, I don't want to make him a hypocrite of myself. But there's, um, and we're talking about the pragmatics of cost and limits and all that kind of stuff. And nobody wants to hear about that. But there's, there's aspects of, of those limitations that are actually incredibly important um, that we're, um, we're forced to produce a certain type of work, and we, our aspirations aren't changing, but the limits are extremely constrained, right? And it becomes um, it's, it's inescapable that's not a factor of the work, 
right? And it's, I think, in, in today's world, um, working in this country for sure, um, you have to have some idea of making connections between your broad, artistic, conceptual aspirations and its reality, right? And it requires a very particular type of intelligence to make that translation. And, um, and then with that came um, radically um, hmm, a very activist position in terms of performance. In this case, the, the beginning of the double skin and the skin came really from the Hoopa Bank and the Hoopa Bank was demanding it because it's a culture which is much more rigid in terms of its idea towards the architecture and the environment and a notion towards public space, which probably won us the competition, and the inclusion of an art piece by Keen Sione, which is the, probably the largest public piece of work in Los Angeles, which was activating um, a, a public space which is um, prior to its requirement in the city, and um, using the human character as part of the facade, as part of the fragment, as part of the infrastructure, which is the image of, of, of Caltrans. And then um, the, the surfaces, which are performative. A, um, the the Brie Soleil made out of photovoltaic, which is all part of the the um, the idea of, uh, of performance having to do with the relationship with this building. When we got to San Francisco, we're just behind Caltrans, and this was a huge, huge shift for us. Um, we had won the uh, competition, and we had not even started work yet, and there were all kinds of articles coming out in newspapers in San Francisco discussing um, amorphosis, um, radical architects are about to enter our city and uh, somewhat um, mess it up. And um, this was an absolute turning point for myself and for our studio. And John, I don't know if you remember, I'm sure you do. We, was that me? Is that you? Oh! Three, two, three, nine, three, five. I'm not gonna answer. Oh, damn. Sorry guys, I'll turn it off. <laughs> That could have been a stunt, but it wasn't. That's hilarious. John, you remember that conversation? We, we sat down and, um, again, um, we're architects. We're, we're, we're inventing things. We're designing things. And um, it became clear that we hadn't started yet and we were entering an immensely hostile climate. And we sat down and decided that um, we would approach this in strategic terms, in tactical terms, and we were going to deal with the workplace um, the, a building that was um, uh, uh, working with the environment and we were going to work with public space. And we knew that we'd be within a political alignment in all three areas in terms of the liberalism, in quotes, of San Francisco. And it was incredibly successful. Never once did we discuss um, the aesthetics. And the building was a response to a series of forces, which in, in fact is exactly the way we work anyway. That I've never been interested in the a prioriness of architecture, starting with a formal pre um, precedent, that the, the, the work is a response to a series of questions and an investigation. And in this case, um, we ended up with a, um, a building which was directly responding to these, um, these uh, issues. And it started with the publicness and uh, the space as a destination. The main public space is the largest federal building in San Francisco and becomes part of that. And it started with a, a very um, aggressive notion towards the environment and a second skin, which was replacing the air conditioner. And out of that came a, a building which had um, extremely high performance. It, uh, the Delta um, would, would, would power 600 homes. And it was the first, um, the first, uh, Built, tall building in the United States where we took out essentially a majority of the, of the air conditioning. And um, it's interesting because even at the opening, uh, it's, it was with Nancy Pelosi at the time, the majority speaker, and now the minority speaker, and um, she didn't like it. Um, she's from San Francisco and they wanted, you know, the stuff that they like, this decorative stuff. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I explained it to her. And it's really interesting because you have to remember that um, I mean, you look at these walls, and these are things that are com we're all comfortable with, and most of the world has no clue what you're talking about. And you need some entry, some narrative. And for me, it would be like looking at the lunar landing module, right? It's not, it might not be a beautiful, quote, kind of object. The more you know about it, um, the more it's compelling. And as I explained the building tour, um, the nature of the workforce, the skip stop, and the social spaces, the fact that it's, it, it had, we, we made an incredibly efficient building, you grow to understand it. 
with, with some connection of value, with an understanding of the, the nature of what the building, how it operates within society in their various terms. And then we got to Eugene, and I'm missing a picture I really wanted, and it was a Michael Hogan in, um, I gave him some Kobe Bryant bright yellow tennis shoes that he actually wore under his, his robe. And because um, this is a project which is about negotiation and probably the most difficult project I ever worked on. But again, an incredible uh, project in rethinking the studio and the reality of producing architecture today. And um, he, um, again, we won a competition very much against his own personal wishes. And um, he literally wanted to build uh, the Supreme Court, and he, he wanted a, a Robert Stern or et cetera and didn't get it, and then we went to work, and well, um, the reiteration is the way we work, and we sit down and we went through, I have no idea, 30, 40, 50 schemes over a year to come up with an idea, and the discussion was fascinating. Um, it's not on formal terms. He is um, a lawyer and is trained in um, case law, right? Um, the conversation was in the reading of the Constitution, right, and he's a, um, a literalist, a constitutionalist. And then we had huge discussions about um, interpretation. There is only interpretation. That's all it is. And it ended up being a conversation about um, the literal versus the open and the uh, evolutionary and the transformative idea. And um, put huge, huge amount of time that ended up with this building. And yet it's loaded with um, DNA material that comes from the traditional courthouse. The piano nobly, the stairs, a social space, you'll see from the courtroom, huge amount of kind of middle ground as we formed a very, very different um, idea of an icon, of a symbol of the third, uh, um, the third part of our political system. And um, as you move through the building, it's going to become evident that the, um, the courtroom is the um, deriving form that is, you understand the courtroom, and again, I could speak for an hour just in this space, having to do with a huge amount of nuance from the, uh, the guillotine-like lamp that separates prosecution and the defense to the window behind the court itself, to the various heights, to the participation of the jury and the proceeding, both observing and connected. And as you understand the nature of the space, it uncodes the collective tissue. We're doing our second Hoopa project, and now we're, we're back in the landscape building area, and we're um, now have looked landscape building infrastructure are seen as a singular idea, and we're pursuing this, this, this notion that we've been working with for, for 10 years at this point, and we're developing these multiple groundscapes. And again, um, if you know Raymond's work, Raymond is a digger, and he was interested in very fundamental ideas of, of, of Earth, and um, I saw a show of his work, oh my goodness, it was probably in the early 70s, and he it introduced me to Pichler, who was his model to some degree, just older than him, and I got extremely interested in this notion of um, the, um, the, the readability, the legibility of ground surface and the, uh, the nature of nature, and the, the, the rethinking of nature as a, a 20th century our 21st century idea vis-a-vis -a, -vis a 19th century Arcadian idea, and we have these multiple layers which reorganize the site and allow you to, to move through the site and understand it in a way that's very particular to your um, construction of that site. And it has to do with the location of movement and the notion of uh, the organization of a building which starts with the manipulation of an augmented groundscape. And then in Madrid, again, um, there's things that happen that are diverse things, which are just um, amazingly uh, useful to the practice and everybody that's there at that time. Um, we were asked to, to do a, a low-cost um, social housing in Madrid, and it's a project that, of course, doesn't exist even in this country. And um, it's built for something, it's like $60 a square foot. It's incredibly simple. And um, we attacked, um, or we looked at it in terms of the idea of the institutional nature of housing. And um, you can see in the, on the, the piece on the upper left, um, we're moving from a block to a very, very different type. And we're, um, we're looking at, of course, the Moorish history in, in, um, 
in Spain, and we're looking at something much closer to a Marrakesh or a, 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 Casa, a Casablanca, the old Casablanca or a Fez, in terms of the, um, the distribution of, um, of a network that's uh, quite different than the institutionalized nature that they, that they their modern project, and that promotes um, scale, um, a residential character, allows the, the user to take uh, ownership of, this, of, this, of his own property, and promotes um, neighborhoods and social interaction that is understood by the, um, the community. Again, um, when we started our work in Cincinnati, it was a, um, I, we're just far enough along where people starting to understand, certain people can understand who you are, what your interests are, and, and uh, I was doing part-time teaching gigs and, at, at the School of Architecture, and I met um, the, the, the head of the architecture program, Ron Cole, and um, he recognized uh, through our conversations that um, we were actually connective tissue people, and they were interested in, in an architecture that, that really had to do with um, city making. And um, so here we are, <coughs> and you're looking at the, the growth of the campus um, as it um, piece by piece with these elements, and then there we are. And it's not even, um, you couldn't even consider a building. There's no elevations, there's no presence. It's literally something that's um, reflexive. It's responsive, it's interpretive of an environment, and it's um, both reinforcing and confronting that environment. It's something new. And the last image you're looking at here is actually an area photograph of the building. That's the, the, real, the real thing. <coughs> And again, um, pursuing uh, <coughs> oh, Hypo Bank, and then way before that, uh, we'd go back to maybe the, the Venice Three House. An idea of a, a certain level of complexity, spatial complexity, <coughs> that starts with a, um, a notion of a building made up of multiple systems, each of the systems having its own authority and capable of making uh, more or less infinite um, diversity. And one that's always talking about <coughs> the relationship of the parts. What was that? Part to whole, or what was the other one? Moss. We talked about last week, part to whole, and what was the other one? I don't even, it doesn't even matter to me. It's, um, it's about the relationships. By the way, you know that, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're always suspicious of words, right? You should be. <coughs> the, uh, they're um, working around the edges. <coughs> when we started uh, Caltech, um, a problem of constraints, not a complaint, just a comment. Um, very, very difficult project. And um, eight of our clients were Nobel people. And they were, um, we were struggling with, um, again, an idea of uh, the apersonal, institutional nature of the, uh, the buildings they're working with. And the building is a combination of um, a series of movement pieces that, that, um, that parcelize the project into sm smaller neighborhoods. And then with that um, came an idea of um, the force vectors which is their, um, their field, particle physics. And those vectors were operating on a Cartesian language. And then at the same time, they were making up a, um, a something that's telescope-like or ground sky that's very much um, mm, somehow just about mimetic of a, a, a cloud chamber that you're looking at force lines that produce this vertical space. And again, at Cooper Union, um, a project that was about constraints. And I guess one of the things that um, you might find that you're going to be in the same place in the not too distant future is that, um, that it, in many cases, you have to even determine the nature of your project. Because when we started this, this project, um, the, the, the zoning envelope was finished, the shape was given, um, the program was given, and it was, of course, um, you couldn't fit it in the, in the zoning envelope. 
And there's our project. And so th from the very get go, um, we're asked to make a piece of architecture, and this is Cooper Union, and they were very, very um, aggressive in wanting something. Uh, Hadick's spirit of the, the certain type of idiosyncratic notion again, totally ridiculous idea, of course. Um, and we're attempting to locate the project. And so here we are looking at the program, and the program, of course, fills up its, its the space, right? And so we get to the project, and what's left is this connective tissue. Well, that was kind of good news, because really what that was then is it became the, um, it, it became really the interior architectural event, right? And, um, and in this case, uh, they were quite sophisticated in looking at a, a social pedagogy. This is a school of art, engineering, and, and architecture. And um, although it sounds good, they, they tend to balkanize, and they're looking at the connective tissue. And so we, we, we invented this space as, a, as a, a vertical piazza. And it's very, very much about that connection. And they're going to... Um, they're going to connect in, on two floors, actually, in public spaces. And then what you're going to look at is that space severs the, uh, the, uh, the skin. Is it's going to be the, um, the demonstration of the, um, the, the collective tissue of the um, creative and intellectual capital that's finding its way to this tree, which is, of course, New York City. And then, of course, the groundscape um, is vital and it's the part that represents the energy of the building and the dynamic of the building. And again, this is a piece of work, and um, this isn't a, a complaint. This is just a reality where one has to very early strategize the location of the intensity of architecture connected to capital, connected to budget. And it's absolutely fundamental, and it's been kind of a key to a huge amount of our work is being able to differentiate the location of that intensity, where you locate the, 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 uh, the capital for architecture. And then this interior space, which um, kind of oozes out into the horizontal and becomes part of the, um, the, uh, the, the, the social connective tissue, which is part of a staircase. And the staircase, of course, is seen as a, a social space. Not a, it's, not, it's not really about movement as much as it's about um, something that's um, parallel to the, the Met Stair or the New York Library, et cetera. But it's part of the social connection. And then this vertical space as it moves up. And you're going to see here, there's um, in construction, where um, this is four or five years ago, we're now way down the, the track in terms of construction. That the relationship, again, having to do with digital environment, having to do with um, uh, the, the, the constructional sequences, c building and, and uh, designing, what do you want to call it, inventing, are becoming more and more singular. And strangely enough, it's, it's, it's taking us back to the very first work, way back to 2468, the Venice 3, et cetera, when we were literally building stuff. We were making stuff, right? And we were in the shop doing that. And then a project that's just in the works, and again, this is one that's going to be very, very much about this. Uh, it's the um, Museum of Science and Nature in, um, in uh, Dallas. And um, it's, it, it's about, I don't know, half a year, nine months away. And, um, Mm, I want to just say one thing about it. I'm going to get to it in a minute. The, the skin, we put a huge amount of time in um, developing this. Okay. Contrary to what was said on Monday, I have to tell you, um, couldn't be further off. Don't believe a word of it. Architecture is going exactly the opposite direction. This is, um, I found this curious, and I added this this week after, after last Monday. Uh, this is an advertisement in the, in the latest architectural record, and it's, our, it's the, the skin that we developed for this project, and it's wholesome concrete. And I happen to know wholesome because they have a very large competition. There is a Swiss concrete company that apparently owns our country. I didn't know that. And um, they're advertising this product, and the company making this is now um, selling this as a product. And where are you, Blythe? Blythe was going, Tom, you should be getting royalties on this stuff. What are you doing? Um, this building is, isn't even opening for nine months. We had people, not only did they read drawings, we have people that are developing the literal um, construction shop drawings, and they're in the contractor, in the subcontractor, 
making the molds. They came from our 3D mill and were prototyped, and then we worked with this product for over a year to make this. And it couldn't be more interesting, because we're building again. It's just about Gothic in terms of an idea, right? We're not, we don't make drawings, we make buildings. We make virtual buildings, and we're always now involved in that, and it's gonna throw the sequences they're going to be completely different. Oh, I wanted something. Where was it? Oh, the ones, the little ones are the, the ones up here, these guys. Those are um, scripted. There's a drawings panel by panel of the pieces. And you can see on this one, the curved, um, incredibly complicated pieces that we made for nothing, right? Literally. This is just, this is a, like, a, this is like a, a target. Right, and we had to do that in this project to make it happen. And um, it's absolutely fascinating what's going on today. And then, um, oh, I'm gonna end with just, and then I'm gonna start my critique. Uh, the Far Tower, I've been working on it for four years, just got back from Paris. And this is um, a culmination, really, of a huge amount of the work I showed you. We're, construct we're constructing site. It doesn't really have a site, so we're literally constructing the site of the building. It's absolutely connected to the, um, an incredibly intense, this is La Defense, a very, very intense environment having to do with the movement of people, that, uh, half million people today coming off the, the, the metro line, the number one line from Paris, and it's gonna be going through the Canet and Airways building and then through our building, and it's gonna form uh, an idea of the public space. Oh, where did that come from? Um, and this public space is 20 stories high, and it's seen as really not belonging to the building. It still belongs to the public armature of transportation prior to the building. It's the transition. And then um, a piece of work that from the initiation, um, it's 300 meters, it's the height of the Eiffel Tower. And it was given to us as a competition in those terms. And its position within the city is the, uh, the tallest building in Paris, of course. And then, um, again, a building which is a collaboration of buildings. It's not a singular thing. It's actually four things and it's a model of the city, and we're, we're, it's a critique of La Défense, and of course La Défense has been used as, a, uh, as an emblem of the, 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 the problems of modernist planning, et cetera, et cetera, and it's attempting a series of corrective maneuvers having to do with the urban site. And um, as it's seen from different positions, it continually um, reinvents itself in terms of um, the, um, the nature of those relationships and connections. And you can see in the plan, it's the same thing. Every plan is different. And again, we have the tools, as you know. I'm speaking to the choir. We have tools today to make um, infinite differentiation. And it's, in this case, it's extremely useful programmatically. And then it gives us a, a wide range of variety, which matches the, um, the spatial needs of a commercial building. And then again, the skin, and a very, very complicated skin, which is operating a performance sense, um, that goes back to San Francisco. And um, we can rationalize that, and we can, um, there were four people working two and a half years just on this part of the project. And we're now at, at again, a very, very different place in terms of um, the specialization that's required within a practice to solve complicated problems. And then finally, um, a project in, um, in, um, in Shanghai, the giant campus, which is a, a, a pharmaceutical um, campus in, in, and it's gonna go all the way back to our beginning interest in earth structures with, with Heiser, and it's gonna go back to 1984 as we were working on a competition for the um, Vienna Expo, and out of that came um, an idea of the relationship of um, an architecture which was made both out of manipulated ground and building, and the two were singular. And um, again, you'll find pieces of that at Hoopa Bank, and it's an idea that I've been working on for. Um, for over 25 years. And um, hmm. by the way, there were, there were mentions made, and maybe it'll come up in questions. The, um, there might be some interesting conversations about just the length of one's investigation. It seems like there's a huge demand for newness, and I would say that huge, a huge amount of these problems would be parallel to how, I don't know, a physicist, a biologist, a mathematician, the medical world, hmm, 15, 20 years isn't considered a particularly long time to investigate a particular problem. And um, although I guess with that would be a conversation that um, you move at your own pace and you have to be comfortable. In fact, if I, was, if, there was, if, uh, if I was asking for any type of advice for the students out there, um, the most important thing in that first three minute, 20 year piece, um, move at your own pace, right? It's, um, 
move move whatever takes you from point to point at the pace you can that you can absorb and internalize. And so here we are, and we're we're involved in this building, which is meant as a hybrid. It's it's landscape, it's building, it's irrelevant. It's um it's um it takes a very different approach. It's 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 intermingling the the rural and the urban. It's looking for a new kind of opportunity, and then it's using all of the internal spaces. Um, highly differentiated. There's no section through the building. If you took it at one meter places, there's no section that's the same. It's completely um, parallel to a, a walk in the forest or whatever you want to talk about. You're looking at that the nose that comes out as a conference room and it's a glass floor. You're over the lake. You're connected to the environment. The movement escapes the building. Again, it's, um, it operates on its own system. It's, um, it's autonomous. And it's always making connection between uh, exterior, interior, breaking down boundary of, of inside, outside. It's, it's crossing a highway into another part of the campus, making a space for the for the automobile. A piece of the body makes that connection. Mm. Um, uh, opportunity. Um, hard to pull this off in this country. There's nothing in that. It's a it's, it's a movement piece, right? And and um, when I was asked by my client what it was for, I just said it's um. It's essential to the idea. It's it's about it, it's, right. It's it's about the notion, and we're we're okay. And then um, a, and a connection to the um, to the uh, the living quarters across one of the canals, and um, again, kind of an odd, a result of a combinatory language that uses uh, four systems, that's um, not composed. It's a series of associations that came directly from the beginning of the Sixth Street House. And then everywhere, there's going to be a, a series of found spaces. And that the project, if it has a broad ambition, it's, it's a territory between willfulness and chance. And it's a series of operational strategies that are looking for um, those types of conditions, which would be the, um, the found conditions of a city, not the architecturalized, but the conditions of the in-between. And again, this language, which is, um, makes up continually different types of environments for various types of functions. And the roofscape, the landscape, which is um, connected and disconnected and fragmented from those environments. And the final image, which is, um, represents the, um, this in-between. And then I just, um, I was lecturing last night in Milano, and um, we won a competition for a, a complex for the ENI. And um, these are just our drawings of that project, and this is what it's going to look like. And the, the pieces up on the side, again, to talk about a very different configuration of the, what used to be a very linear approach towards architecture. We're working at a micro, macro simultaneously. So I've got a team working on the skin. They're starting at pre-concept, right? Which will be one of the most key parts of the project. Okay. Oh dear, I've used up 40. <laughs> I've used up 40 minutes, and I'm just got started. <laughs> the um, I no, I'm only I'm only kidding. Uh, I'm going to ask three questions, and. Uh, there's Raymond, and he's thinking, uh, what's next? He could have been thinking, what's next? Um, and if he was here today, um, I do not think he would agree with this statement. Um, the revolution will not be televised. Gil Scott Heron, he died last year. Um, I'm going to suggest, or I'm going to ask a series of questions that. Um, I'm going to suggest that the, um, the avant-garde, an idea of revolution um, as we knew it, and as an agent of change, is um, somewhat um, nostalgic and romantic and is ready for some sort of a realignment. Not the um, impulse, not the desire for change, but the mechanism uh, and, and the, the emotional attachment, let's say, of uh, avant-gardeism which um, propelled me as a young man. I was convinced and, um, that that was the, 
the, the role of the architect. And with that, um, the realignment of the self as the, um, the broadest, in the broadest sense of the word, in terms of a, uh, the generation of one's work. And I would suggest, or I would ask questions, and I'm asking these questions of myself, and we're talking about it in the studio, um, that the exhaustion of any set of ideas is finally within the formal. And to, um, if you're interested in the maintaining a trajectory and, and continually transforming, that one has to attack um, the, the broader questions that, that formulate your project, and one understands the limits of the, the formal. And I have a sense that, um, hmm, again, and you're talking somebody that I've been doing it for 40 years, and I'm having a Leverance moment, maybe. I don't know if you know Leverance's last building, but an acknowledgement of the limitations of the formal, um, which I think is, is, is reasonable. Um, this notion of um, the self, I think, would be immediately lead us to an idea of collaboration. And there's several things that are taking place here. I think that there's been an immense increase in the scale and the complexity of the work that we're offered today. And, and of course, places like uh, the Mideast and, and China become part of that. that um, when I'm having, uh, three days ago, I'm having coffee with Stephen Hall, and I don't think he has a project in China that's under three or four million square feet. And it's just, it's, it's what takes place today. And it, it, I find it completely interesting because it wasn't that long that, um, and it's challenging, the totalizing nature of singularity versus multiplicities. And, I, and I'm interested in, well, do we have strategies? Do we have the mechanisms to deal with projects at that scale? And um, I'm gonna talk about that in my conclusion. and. Um, and then again, I'm going to say mm, revolutionary. Um, something took place at the end, middle end of the 19th century through the early part of the 20th century, which was a massive shift in who we are, right? And whether you start with, with Nietzsche, whether you go to Darwin, whether you go to Freud, wherever you want to go, in any place in the arts, there was this massive explosion, which essentially rewrote the nature of our, of our universe. And it had to do with a dynamicism and a reality, a biological, physical, mathematical reality of who we are. And this is over 100 years ago. And um, I would suspect that today, um, the notion would be something more um, evolutionary. And it, it connects with the notion of the collaborative. And I would have thought with that, um, the realities of um, collaboration and specialization, well, it was 1969 when we put the lunar lander on the moon. And that was um, two and a half years of work with 9,000 people. And, mm, I put it out, reasonable model for the certain types of projects we get today. Um, the, the, last, the last subject um, is the broadest one. And it seems as though um, quite opposite of what took place Monday. Because I would have said we were facing a dead end. And we're facing a dead end with a very limited, Eric already said it clearly in his introduction, uh, in my opinion, a somewhat limited idea of what architecture is or isn't in terms of the program. And it seems as though just the opposite is possible today, that we're at a time when we can radically expand um, the, um, the nature of the, uh, the tasks that we put in fr front of us in terms of a discipline. Um, the contemporary thought, um, the objective and subjective, are not different and opposing fields, but folds of a single reality. That's Deleuze, right? We understand today that that subjective, objective reality becomes the framework of how we tackle our work. And mm, you hear thinking out of the box, incredibly old school. That's absurd. We invent the box. We make the box. We establish the program of architecture, and that is our role at this time of history. And there couldn't be a time that's more um, opportune to um, relocate and expand the problems that we're capable and um, useful in solving in today's society. And of course, um, the shift has moved to strategy and to broader tactics of solving problems that are located um, within um, economic, political, ecological, social, cultural frameworks. And it's an absolute imperative that we understand our um, how we um, shape behavior, 
how we shape form that shapes behavior that in some way connects to these broad notions of, um, of their um, potentialities. And um, finally, um, it's located in values. And again, I found it really odd in the, um, the meta projects that ended with Corbusier that he missed the main project, which is the broad humanistic project, which is a political, cultural, social project. That was the huge optimism of modernism that still lives with us today, right? We're, we're somewhat maybe confused in terms of where that's taking us or not. And then I think with that, um, Hernan and I were talking about the other day, um, comes some sort of an ethical position that it's impossible once one discusses values, one discuss, once, once one discusses architecture's location in the world, that, um, that the notion of ethics isn't somehow a major kind of opportunity of a discussion. And it'll be very much parallel with taking place in biology and medicine um, and law, et cetera. Oh, am I? If I go 15 or 20, am I okay? I'm gonna get to the last piece here. I'm, I'm, I'm a little slower, I'm sorry, I'm not quite, <laughs> my brain doesn't kind of operate fast enough right now. The, um, okay, what I'm gonna show you, I think is, is Somewhat again, it was a trajectory was somewhat obvious that took place over the last eight or nine years, and um, in terms of discussing these issues, and it started with um, uh, Richard Kshalik, uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, used to be a, the head of MoMA, um, MoCA, um, came to me and was interested in producing um, provocations in Los Angeles, and we started this LA Now, and it, he was thinking of projects. And, and, and I was thinking, hmm, I don't even know the context. And it was an opportunity to kind of really rethink the city in broader terms. And we, um, we started looking at this thing we call Los Angeles, and 17 and a half million people. And, and it's, it's, it's the fact that it's the size of, it's the, the, the fourth largest state. And it's the size of, um, of, uh, of Holland and two Austrias. And it's, um, we look at it in terms of um, its um, ecologies and its, the, 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 the climates and its vegetation. The, the flora and fauna. We looked at earthquakes and movement. It, it followed a trajectory of, um, of moving to broader issues and strategy. And then um, we, we did the work in, in um, the LA. And what happened was really fascinating. We started projects in LA. And what happened is my group of students were working collectively and were producing um, fairly comprehensive projects because I've got people going together. And I'm finding, by the way, that a lot of my students are um, actually are interested bottom-up, um, Arab Spring. Um, they're interested in projects that are connected to the, to their political. And, um, but out of that came very different projects, and they were much more network-oriented, not geographical, and they were connecting dots, very much the way Kessler talks about in his active creation, that creativity is nothing but connecting dots up to seven in his theory. And uh, the more um, disperse, the more, um, the bigger difference, the larger, just about non sequiturs of the dots is the kind of higher level of creativity. And um, what they were doing is they were connecting the dots in a very different way and coming up with extremely interesting projects, right? That were, they were reconfiguring the problem is what they were doing. And I got very, very interested in this notion of dealing with the, um, the beginning of a project starts with the configuration of the problem, all right? And, um, and then out of that came some continued work and we went to work on the, the PALS, the, the planned um, urban developments in Madrid. And there we had a client because the mayor and the, the urban design people, you can actually, they're interested in it and they'll talk to you. And we did a series of studies that, that really rethought their very generic kind of a priori um, grid systems that were making these new towns, and they were radically specific, and they were also dealing with broad, broad informational bases, macro, micro, and we'd now developed a kind of a system to kind of look at these problems, which was um, highly kind of specific. And then um, I was going to show you, that are not here, um, two projects uh, that come out of a book I just published, Combinatory Urbanism, and they're projects that I've been working on for about eight years now. And the first was 2012. And again, it really, in a way, it's kind of nice that we don't have anything. Um, a competition, four people, Olympics in New York, um, looked at the problem, and by this time, we were working in a very different way. And as we studied the city, studied the site, um, it was an Olympic village for um, 
25,000 people that was going to turn into a permanent place in, in, um, in Queens. Um, as we started connecting things, we came up with a very different set of problems, and it ended up being um, what was needed there was open space. And we did a complete study of, of parks and open space in, in the boroughs. And uh, we configured an arrangement of the, ho of the housing and the ancillary spaces where we used 15%, if we used 25% uh, of the site, we used 15 of, the, um, of 60 acres. Well, we had a couple mid-reviews, and it was with Dan Doktoroff, who was heading the Olympic effort, who was um, working right under Bloomberg. And I remember um, uh, midway through, I asked him, is anybody else on our tack? And it was Zaha, and the, the usual figures. And he said no. And I remember coming back to the studio going, crank it up. This is ours. We got it. And um, we, got, we won it, of course. What we did is that we located the problem in another location. Everybody's thinking housing, and they're designing housing. We developed housing that was secondary to producing public space and um, increase the density. Um, what's his name? Ross. Steve Ross, related, tough guy, um, was part of the group. And we said, OK, we'll give you 10% more housing because we're going to play a win-win strategical game. And sure enough, when um, we won the project, it was on the press. Um, Bloomberg shows up to do his thing. Uh, Dr. Off whispers in his ear, um, what does he care about? The legacy of this project will be the largest park in Queens, blah, 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 all right? Not even a mention about housing, right? And hugely, hugely important, right? And then again, um, we were involved in the cornfields, and now we're being invited by James Corner. And um, this is another thing that's really interesting. Architects are so not even understood as doing city planning, um, Bill, you excluded, one of the few. They don't even ask architects anymore. They go to landscape architects. Three of the projects were invited by landscape architects. Unbelievable. Absolutely incredible, right? This is how narrow our profession has become, right? And um, Jim calls us, and the first thing I asked him, I knew the project. We had studied um, Legion Park in one of my UCLA studios. So I had a huge amount of data about that site. And I said, hey, I've got some information here. Are you interested in exploring the project, or do you need the work? And he said, no, Jim's a fantastic guy, super conceptual, really, really incredible character. And he says, no, let's, just, let's do something that's interesting, and we'll definitely not win it, right? And we, went, we proceeded with that project. And again, um, looking at various conditions, and we're like going, huh, Dodger Stadium was just about to be purchased at that time, hadn't gone bust yet. We're going, Dodger Stadium on this site, does it work? Call up a consultant. Happens to be the guy that designs all the baseball stadiums. It's the oldest one. It doesn't work anymore. Wrong place. Too many cars. Yes, it works. And it's kind of like uh, San Francisco. It's got a short left field or something. And um, we started doing this. And the, the site on the hill, you can see the ocean. It's five minutes from downtown. And you can put 30,000 people on it. And we showed two configurations. Low for families and, one, and another high rise with golf courses and that kind of thing. And completely reconfigured the problem. And then did an economic study working with Rand and had enough money left over to do the LA River, which would connect Griffith Park. We walked in and we're presenting it to um, the Rangers. Problem. Where's our park? Swings, playground for kids, All right? Huge problem. And this one, I was so frustrated, I actually went to our mayor and uh, talked to Antonio. And um, not the right environment to put in history in this country. There's just, Big thinking, big ideas are just not part of thinking. But it'll, it'll change. It has to. Because um, there's, there's no possibility we can continue developing in the way we're doing with the, the, the absolute infantile kind of a process that's taking place. OK, with that being said, and you saw nothing, but maybe it didn't matter, I'm going to conclude um, with seeing where this is going to lead or not lead. Um, I'm going to paraphrase um, Sola Morales and the differences. And he says something like, um, or he discusses that there's no reason to jettison the entire foundation of our 20th century desire, modernism, the huge aspirations, the radical manifestos of the beginning of this 20th century, um, and that we can maintain that desire to restore a certain ethical order in our world. And um, by removing utopianism, and the reductionist position of their ideas, we can move forward in something much more complex and um, keeping our aims at some transformative idea with the nature of um, a humanistic enterprise 
and I would even go as far as to say therapeutic. It's not unreasonable to do that. And, um, and then he goes on to talk about a present situation which seems to be kind of lost in both rigor and a certainty without the radicalism that was established. And, um, and, and, and then an outcome that is a problematic intellectually. And of course, he discusses the, um, the hesitancy and the doubt connected to the, um, the lack of any singular project, the fragmented nature of personal worldviews. And mm, I kind of break with him here. Um, and then I, I think that there's going to be a much more complicated conversation because we live in a very fragmented world. And it's not possible to connect to any singular idea. That's not where we are in history. But there is definitely possible to find connective tissue. There has to be. Otherwise, we're done as a profession, really. We're not going to operate. There'll always be room for a 1,000 of us if you're really good. Don't worry about it. The rest of you should be interested, right? You can, you can leave out the, the, the absolute top of the talent. They don't have to go to school. We're not talking about, we're talking about a profession. We're talking about a discipline. And it's going to connect to um, certainly the academic environment. And um, I think there's a possibility of doing this within um, an interest in a more collective environment. And I think it's going to happen uh, in an evolutionary form. And again, I would take issue with PE and that um, the notion of the meta project, I left thinking it's like waiting for the next messiah or something. It's an absolutely absurd idea. It's going to take place with a much more complex series of, of, of conditions that's much more parallel to the rest of our world and how we investigate other disciplines, right? If you were to, if you, if I went to Astro, if I went to my Caltech guys, they would just laugh at me if I actually said that. I'm looking for some kind of singular person. It'd be absolutely preposterous, right? There's eight of them out of a couple hundred Nobel people, and they work absolutely collectively, and they're talking to each other all over the world every day, and it'd be absolutely ridiculous, right, to solve the kind of problems we're asking to solve. And then I'm going to end with, um, if I haven't been uh, uh, kind of ridiculously um, naive or optimistic, um, I'm going to go back to my youth, and uh, I'm going to quote uh, Kennedy as he was talking about um, work in Washington. And um, he discusses Washington. Um, it should express our highest aspirations of urban life, providing the setting in which men and women can live to the responsibilities as free citizens. He wrote that in 1963. I was 19 years old. And um, we have to have um, some idea some positive aspiration. We have to be somehow concerned to be how will we be remembered in 30 years from now. Thank you so much. They chat? That's the fun part. sitting down in the corner over here in the front. So I guess, uh, are you saying that the, the next meta project, if that's the term you would even use, is a collaborative effort? And um, should the architectural discussion then look to uh, interdisciplinary discussions for that, that next project, like uh, the sciences and how you brought up the idea that the lunar lander might be? I purposely didn't make it into an either or Right, it's a, I'm just saying that it requires, um, there seems to be potential for various realignments. And I'm speaking personally through the, the trajectory I've gone through as a young architect at the present, and uh, that I still observe, and it's, um, I know where I'm speaking. I know this place, don't get me wrong, it's, uh, I know exactly, um, I just walked down the corridor. Um, I think there's, uh, I think we're looking for, for uh, locations where one can utilize the more complex, the wind that Eric started with. 
the, um, the more complex aspects that we're interested in architecture, that we can find a, um, we can locate it within the world. Otherwise, we're, um, we have no project. We don't exist, all right? And we can exist as poets. We can exist in, in our private selves. And for some of us, that's absolutely fine. That would suit us. It can't suit a profession, all right? And again, maybe I'm affected by a certain pragmatism. I have a practice, and I'm, I'm, I, it's in, inescapable that, I, that I, have a, I make references to that because I'm interested in producing work, right? And um, I'm speaking to, I'm, spe I'm addressing it based on that. But I think that, um, I mean, it happens here to absolutely, of, of all places. This is a place that has a, a huge connected tissue in terms of very complex conceptual stuff, right? That you absolutely operate on a nonverbal level. And I'm saying that that just has to be um, expanded a bit. But I think also the types of projects will be, it'll expand the diversity of problem types. And that all of you can't be involved in um, this particular project if you're interested in participating in the world. And again, I'm very clear about where I am today. Make no, <laughs> I understand completely. I was start of this, I was the beginning of the formation of this place in 1972. And it's a place I hugely admire. And I'm very aware of the, 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 what I'm bringing to the table. Um, but it seems to me you're, they're most fit, I'd feel most comfortable in um, this environment making, part of this environment making some of those, that expansion. What I did or didn't say in the urban work, what I was interested with as I started the urban projects was the, um, a very different approach to large scale projects that integrated the uh, intuition and the qualitative aspects of architecture with the analytical and quantitative response of the planner. And so that if I had shown you the slides, they're filled with um, architectural moments, let's say, or architectural ambitions, which have nothing to do with the tradition of planning, that they come with um, a sensibility, which, has, um, which is located in some way within the private realm, right? which is interpretive, right? But not statistical, as well as representing methodologies of ability to, to uh, deal with intricative, complex intricate environments. And again, we're all trained for that. That's what you guys do. There's no other field that really deals with, right? Huge amounts of integrative forces that somehow form something and then give it some sort of coherence. Because again, I didn't talk about that, so what we do. We, 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 the discussion is the type of coherency Right? What resides in that coherency? What kind of information is, is located within the things that you're working on, right? Hmm. So, uh, congratulations, it's, it's awesome. It's great to see all the work. I, I wanted to ask you about the wind. Um, because, I mean, you mentioned at some point uh, in your San Francisco project uh, the idea about not, take, not talking about the things that are implicit in your work, you know, AI, the formal work, a certain aesthetic predilection. And, and I, I'm personally interested in that in terms of, like, how do you, you know, like, I know you're not saying that architecture or, say, your architecture is a force of nature, AI, the wind, you know, that at some point you have to account for all these things. And I'm just interested to hear you say, like, how do you, you know, how do you do it? And one, how do you do it with your clients, let's say? Like, um, you know, talking about something that you're not interested in talking, you know, you want, it, like, that problem, let's say the formal problem, the design problem to stay more in the background, you know, so you address the tactic, the strategic issues. And then what's your advice to, let's say, in a more pedagogical way, uh, given that architects, talking to architects in an academic world, we tend to kind of, uh, you know, be inclined to explain ourselves, no? Explain the moves, explain the kind of, the, the, the form of the project, let's say, you know, the design. I don't know, it's... Was there, the, the question was what on that? Oh, the question is like, <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you go about it, you know, and... Uh, no, but look, uh, 
Svina, you, the, there's a, it's always operating in a couple of planes and there's a discourse. And, and like a lot of us here, I work collectively and in dialogue. And, um, but, but it looks but in a particular that, way. But that dialogue, as you also know, is quite complicated in that it's going to be much closer to a Bergman or a Fellini or a, a Woody Allen and that you're working with people which you're completely dependent on the nonverbal, the sensing of some idea, right? And it's, there's no question about that. And, um, and of course, what's always the most interesting is, is the stuff that isn't, you can't verbalize, that's only available in the work, right? Um, so it's like the wind. I, <laughs> Um, I want to ask you a different me, question. Me. Um, would you, sorry, Eric, I, I'm just talking over you. Uh, w what would you do if somebody asked you to design a city, one with no context and no, nothing to reflect on or be reflexive to? Because that's, that's the old modernist problem. No, no context. The, the REM started that conversation that there's less and less history. And, um, we're involved in a project I didn't show you that, in China. Uh, that's a fragment of a city that's 15, 16 million square feet. Um, you, uh, I'm borrowing from found conditions. And uh, actually, we have another a, a tall building that I'm borrowing from the conditions of Far Tower, because Far was so rich in uh, its environment and so specific that it developed, in a way, a new type. It's not even, it's just an, it's an office building, it's a specific, right? And, um, mm. uh, very, it just leads me to another really, question. Really, really, and it's, it's one of the mm, it's it's a, one of the more important conversations today, having to do with the developing world. It's interesting though, because if you look at um, there's only a few models available, I think, aren't there? And if you look at history, the grid, the found city, mm, that seems to dead end track pretty quickly. Right, that it's there, there's always something. It's n not nothing, right? There's there's uh, there's a topographic addition. There's a culture. There's a, there's there's a, a, a macro or middle ground location. We don't design and right. It's, there's never the complete tabula rasa, and I, I, I it would be a more complex. I think it's a really uh, one of the most difficult problems today, but it, it clearly have to do with some beginning idea of a complexity of the city which requires an organizational idea. And for me, we start with something that connects with multiple organizations and multiple autonomies. A conversation, by the way, was started by Smithson in 1944 that I'm still working with. That was, I was born in 1944, and he made a very, very clear argument, arguing with Bakama, and um, Woods was there, and he was right. And there he was arguing about, um, who was it? It was the Baum's star theory, the single and he found it preposterous, and he made a very, very clear argument about the necessity for multiple systems, each having their own autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. I'm still working with that same idea. And I think that it definitely starts with an ability to be interested in that kind of complexity that'll lead you somewhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the sequence of the three lectures uh, Monday, Tuesday, and the following Wednesday. If you put that package together and run them consecutively, I think it's enormously helpful for the, for the discourse and for the school. I think it's a, it's a unique moment. You might get one and another one a long time later. So I think that it, it raises a lot of questions. And I, what, what I wanted to ask you was, was that Kipnis, in, in a way, suggested, and I don't think you touched on this at all, that, that, that in a sense, nothing is so until you make it so. And having made it so, and it could be any of the guys you mentioned. It could be Freud, and it could be Darwin, and it could be in, any of those people. And I think what's, what's appealing is that, that in a way, in a existential way, you started with zero and you actually made a case where there wasn't any case and, and it has an idiom and it has a language 
And for all the use of the term idiosyncrasy, it belongs in a very particular way to a very particular person. I mean, if it were true that this was part of a shared experience, if that were literally true, then it might follow, might follow, that the language of the architecture or the space making would be more a generic proposition, meaning lots of people would be doing it because it comes out of some collective sensibility that we all share. But it's, it's, it's something, it, there may be something in that, and that's the, the grounds that you choose to talk about it on. But it's, it's peculiar in, in its nuance, in its shape, in its language, and actually, for all the differences in projects and sites, there is, there is a very large consistency to it. So to explain it in a pragmatic way from site to site doesn't explain the consistencies, which is not a pejorative at all, but there's something else which is, which is dragging it along. And I would, I would say that belongs to a discussion of invention and discovery, which goes back to what Kipnis was trying to figure out, which is it's not so until you make it so, and you made it so, and you can make the case. And I think, I think when people look at that and listen to that, and I think one of the questions really had to do with that. In other words, are we talking about what we're looking at or not? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, that, that's a, I mean, something I've thought about, of course. The, um, the consistency I find is problematic. That's the struggle. I, wait a second, I can show you an exercise that has all the same problems. Ah. Yeah, these are these are three-dimensional paintings I've been working on, and they, they start from a very disciplined idea of, of four elements, and I'm looking at making organizational matter, which is radically different. And um, I'm struggling with the, the trajectory that's moving me out of prescribed formal territory, but it's maybe hopeless because it's I'm right back. Right? He's looking, smiling already, going, yes, you're right, it is hopeless. Wow, what other microphones? I don't know. I mean, I've been in your office many times, and the truth is, well, first of all, thank you for the lecture. It's one of those lectures that you want to go back to the office and do work. So I suck it up to you in that part. And I've been in your office many times, and your eyes never shine as much as when you talk about those abstract models. I mean, it's the one that still capture your child. Uh, I just want to go back to the thing about, in relation to those drawings, and I think to understand to what Marcelo was asking, mine was more about, you were talking about that almost, that it will not, almost not be a next revolution, that it will be evolution, or a lot of evolution that maybe amount to that. But one of the things I will say is your lecture, for me, was incredibly ideological, even though you don't want to put it in those terms. And the problem I have with if revolution is going to be replaced by these multiple evolutions and so on, what do we do with the ideology? I mean, because the ideological discourse is so attached to the kind of a revolutionary thinking that I'm not saying that in the evolution there is no place for ideology, but it will need to change. And if that's so, how you see that in that part of the argument? Because again, for me, your lecture was incredibly ideological in the best possible way. So. If revolution is not the model, what do we do with the ideological part that, for me, is still architecture with capital A cannot avoid, or should not avoid, ever? That's what I was asking. Oh, I, um, I can't answer. 
answer the question. I, I, we're at a, um, we're occupying some transitional place philosophically. And um, I can in some way sense or articulate the problematic of um, certain ideological positions, but I can't necessarily replace them. And I'm frankly not even convinced that it's required. I don't totally agree with you that there, there is that connection, that we need PE or somebody, that in fact is possibly that that's problematic if it's not located within um, certain aspects of social, cultural, political reality. Uh, and I think that the shifts that have taken place have been so um, enormous that we live in a world that is, um, the majority of the world is still 150 years behind reality in terms of the understanding of how we operate in the world, whether it's intellectually, philosophically, biologically. And it's, um, it makes for an extremely difficult environment for an architect that we're already, um, we're advanced in our perception of the world and we we can only find a, a constituency of a few percent. If there's a, if there's a tragedy today, it's in the, in our culture. I'm looking at the room and this huge, huge amount of talent. And um, there's a diminishing, actually, understanding of, of our project, certainly of the um, interpretive, intuitive, deeply poetic, personal, human. And it's, um, it seems to be getting worse and not better, having to do with, like Peter mentioned it too, the, our educational system are completely eliminating any broader thinking, right? That it's a very simplistic, analytical kind of thinking. Although I have to say, I'm not, I'm not quite so convinced that you'd have to sense that you're missing something or you need something. And I don't necessarily feel as deprived. I'm not part of that community. We were just chatting um, before the lecture the next day. And I think, uh, again, looking back in the last 25, 30 years, you could make an argument that um, there's a certain type of erudition that's been used in a somewhat destructive way. Or you could ask uh, whether it's actually been useful in producing a serious architecture, which we can somehow come to agreement with, or whether it hasn't um, obfuscated the types of questions we need to be asking. But again, that's me. And, um, and I think it takes some, um, I was reading recently a, a, an article on the uh, Seeing is Forgetting, Erwin, and it was really hilarious as they talked about him. He, he was completely disinterested in anything but his own trajectory until he was in his 50s. And then he decided he needed to join the group and, become area down. He started reading, and he's reading the Lacans and the Luces and the Qataris and blah, 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 right? Um, and when he read them, he, he underlined them in a, a black and a, and a red pen. Very, very important. By the time he read it, he could disagree, right? And um, I think there's been a huge problem in my generation in the use of intellectual material that's highly misunderstood or used as a, uh, somewhat cynically in a culture that you realize it's easy to intimidate people in an extremely pragmatic culture where very few people are read or educated in a classical sense. Huh? And um, when I was last week talking in the introduction to this guy, my son was reading my, my little introduction and I had mentioned um, Plato and I had some mention of Hegel. He goes, Dad. And he's educated, right? He's read the time as. And we talk about Hobbes. And he can articulate Hobbes' discussion of morality politically and religiously, et cetera. And he goes, Dad, you can't do this. You don't know what you're talking about. You, you, you're, you don't know Hegel. 
you don't know Plato, right? Take it out. And so I put the little line, I'm way beyond what I know of. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's, it's um, again, I'm a very pragmatic guy in some ways, and I have to need something, and then I look for it, and I find it. So if I quoted Deleuze, it's something that means something to me, and he can articulate much better than I can, right? And it's interesting to me, and it's useful to me. And I'm very um, selfish and kind of demanding of what I want to use. Because I need it, I have to. I have to take it and possess it. Otherwise, I'm not interested. In it. I think we're. I'm yeah, we're personally a bit wasted. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs>